I'd like to introduce Hugh Wessel. What you is going to come up. He spoke to us earlier this year. He's from the Institute for Faith, Work, and Economics. Now, how do those three things work together, Hugh? Come on up. Thanks, Jim. Many of the Christians I talk to today are very discouraged. More and more, they feel estranged from the mainstream culture as the Christian influences that have shaped and supported the structure of Western civilization seem to be collapsing around them. As David Brooks recently lamented in a recent um, New York Times article, American culture is shifting away from orthodox Christian positions, and unfortunately, so are many evangelical Christians. In his recent book, Renaissance, The Power of the Gospel, However Dark the Times, Oz Guinness sets out to answer the following question. Can the Christian church in the advanced modern world be renewed and restored even now and be sufficiently changed to have a hope of again changing the world through the power of the gospel? Or is all such talk merely whistling in the wind? Pointless, naive, irresponsible. You see, Guinness goes on to point out that the problem in the evangelical church, Christian church in the United States today is that we are in profound cultural captivity. As Christians, we are called to be in the world, but not of the world. Unfortunately, our inability in the church today to be in the world and not of the world has robbed the church of its effective witness over the last hundred years. That's where the Institute of Faith, Work, and Economics comes in. We're trying to change that by producing content that we can push out through existing networks of evangelical Christians to inform and educate believers in what God has made them to do. We believe the power of Christianity to influence culture rests in its practice of truth as revealed in the scripture, and that Christians have the ability to faithfully and fruitfully live out the gospel in the world in which they live. And if they do that, they can make an incredible difference, and I believe reshape the culture Now, how do we do that? We do it by talking to people about the importance of their work. Not only the work they do in their vocation, but the work they do in their communities, in their families, in their churches, because the New Testament calls all that work stewardship. And we're called to be good stewards of everything God has given us. And if we can do that faithfully and fruitfully, we will see a difference in the places where we live and work. If we look at Genesis 1, we see that God comes to Adam and Eve and gives them their job description. And likewise, I believe our job description as well. He says to them, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth with my images. And then go subdue the earth. The, the Hebrew word there for subdue is literally the word kabosh, which means Make the earth useful for human and enjoyable for human inhabitants. This was our original calling. And I would suggest that the gospel of Jesus Christ redeems us and brings us back to that original calling. Unfortunately, that idea has been lost by most of the church today. Now, that's not always been the case. In the last year, we, 100 years, we've wandered away from it. But if you go back before that, in fact, I would argue that if you look at the history of Western civilization, that for everything except maybe the last 100 years, almost every important thing that's been accomplished, with maybe a few exceptions, but very few, have been done by Christians who understood it was their call on their life to bring flourishing to the people around them. They started the first hospitals. They started the first universities. They abolished slavery. They, they brought in women's suffrage. They did many, many things that made life better for everybody. 
But unfortunately, like I said, we've forgotten that. I recently had a friend to me came up and said to you, if we can just get 20% of the country to be converted, to be good Bible-believing Christians, we can change the culture back to the way it's supposed to be. I said, you know, we don't need that many. There's a, there's a, a social science called minority influence, and they've done a lot of testing, a lot of study, and they say a smaller group as 1% of a population can influence the other 99%. But there's a caveat there. They have to be seen by the 99% as being a positive influence. And unfortunately today, most Christians aren't seen by the 99% as a positive influence. What are we known for today? We're known for what we're against, not what we're for. We're not known for the good things that we're doing in the culture and in society. We've got to get back to that. If we're going to be salt and light that God called us to be. Now, what we have done at the Institute for Faith, Work, and Economics to try to reach out to people, we've developed this content, and we're pushing it really in three main channels. First, we're trying to reach business leaders like many of you. Second, we're trying to reach educators. And third, we're trying to reach pastors. And to be quite honest, pastors are the hardest group to get, uh, <laughs> get, to, get to listen to you because they think they have already, all the answers already. But don't quote me on that. <laughs> in the area of education, we've developed curriculum. We've developed courses. Uh, we're in, we've got uh, educational programs currently in 25 different uh, Christian colleges. Uh, that's going to be expanded to 100 colleges in the next two years. Business leaders, we've developed seminars. Uh, uh, we do a blog five days a week that goes out every morning at 6 o'clock, encouraging business people to think about the importance of the work before they go to work. Uh, with pastors, we've got articles and books we've written. We've done Bible studies. We recently put a Bible study up on something called the Bible app. I don't know if you've heard of that. But the Bible app basically... Um, is something you can download these little Bible studies. So we put this Bible study about a month ago. We've had over 50,000 people download it and finish it, which is really, which is really quite amazing. Um, so how can you help us? Let me give you three things. First, you can engage with our content. Go to our website, look at what we're doing. Second, we're looking for some volunteers to help us test Bible studies that we've developed uh, with small groups and give us feedback as we begin to roll those out. Third and most important, we're making a commitment to be in Southern California on a regular basis. We believe this is a very important place. It's one of the three places, I think, in the United States where culture is being shaped. And so we want to make a commitment to be here. We'd like some of you to help us with access to business people, to educators, and to pastors so that we can talk to them about our programs. So let me close with one last story. We have something that we talk a lot about at the Institute called the four-chapter gospel. It's a way of looking at all redemptive history in four chapters, creation, fall, redemption, restoration. Creation shows the way things were. The fall explains the way things are. Redemption shows the way things could be, and restoration shows the way things are going to be. Now, we live in the third chapter, the chapter of redemption. Jesus, when he walked on the face of the earth, lived here in the third chapter of redemption. Now, we believe that Jesus healed the blind man. We believe that Jesus fed the 5,000, right? Nod your heads, right? Um, I'm a Presbyterian. You don't have to say amen, but just nod your head. That's all I need, right? They don't call us the frozen chosen for nothing, right? <laughs> so Jesus healed the blind man. He fed the 5,000. Did Jesus heal everyone in Israel when he was here on the face of No. Did he feed everyone that was hungry? No. Could he have? Of course he could have. He's the son of God. He could have done anything he wanted. So the real question you should ask yourselves is why didn't he? We have a theologian on our staff, and he would say, well, Jesus was demonstrating his power and authority on the face of the earth as the Son of God, and all that's true. But I think there's a simpler explanation that helps us as we think through some of the things we've talked about so far tonight, and that's simply this. When Jesus healed the blind man, he was showing them there could be a time. Remember, he's in the third chapter, third chapter of redemption. He was showing them there could be a time when no one is blind. When he feeds the 5,000, he's showing them there could be a time when no one's hungry. And we, as his disciples, are to go and do likewise. We're to go out into the world and bring about flourishing that not only influences culture, but that glorifies God and serves the common good. One last quote. D.K. Chesterton once wrote, five times... It's been said the church was going to the dogs. 
and all five times the dogs died. We hope that will be one more time. Thank you. Pray with me for Faith, Hugh and, and uh, Faith work in economics. Lord, I just think about Hugh's message and just uh, how much you, know, you care about what we do and the witness it is to those around us. And I just pray that each person here would uh, take away something from this that would uh, maybe change what they might do tomorrow. Lord, uh, impact us. And thank you for Hugh. Thank you for his heart to, to uh, lift this message up uh, across our nation and to challenge us. And we just pray that you would continue to bless him and his ministry. And we pray this in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Thank you Jim. Thank you.